Tonight, coronavirus claims a life outside China, while inside, hundreds of Canadians await rescue. If we were to come down with anything, we wouldn't really have a lot of options for treatment. What will happen to them when they get home? Plus, we'll answer your questions about the virus and how best to protect yourself. And storm fallout in southern BC. It was relentless. It just kept going and going. Hundreds of skiers stuck on a mountain. Plus, the tight race in Iowa. The stakes are incredibly high. Adrian walks us through the moves and counter moves at the first Democratic test and the candidate's last push. This is The National. Fear and concern over the coronavirus continues to grow around the world. Here in Canada, the risk remains low, but elsewhere, more cases, more deaths. And now the virus has killed a man in the Philippines, the first death outside of China, the epicenter of the outbreak. Coronavirus has now claimed 362 lives. The 44-year-old man was actually from Wuhan, China, where the virus originated. He arrived in the Philippines 10 days ago with a woman who remains under observation. In China today, the new one-day death toll is 57, and new infections in China rose by more than 2,800 cases, bringing the total to more than 17,000. Today, Canada said it's chartering a plane to pick up Canadians stranded in China, revealing that 352 have asked for help getting out. The plane will land at CFB Trenton in eastern Ontario, and all on board will be kept on the base for 14 days for further medical assessment and observation. Sasha Petrasik begins our coverage from inside China, where desperation is mounting by the day. In Wuhan, they count the body bags. That's eight in the van parked outside the hospital. In a video secretly shot by a visitor and posted on the internet. Inside the emergency ward, the man next to the bed is distraught, sobbing in grief. My father, he says, he's gone. He stopped breathing. That's one more victim of the coronavirus here. Another is shown being carried out of the hospital. And yet another body bag is removed from an apartment building by men in hazmat suits. That person never even made it to hospital in a situation that's all too familiar to those struggling to get relatives diagnosed and treated here. The hospital staff just told them that they could not perform the tests. I don't, I think it's because of a capacity issue. These are the stories coming out of the quarantine zone here in the epicenter of this epidemic. Stories of hundreds of deaths and infections mounting by the thousands. Medical staff overwhelmed, supplies unavailable. On Chinese state TV, none of that is mentioned, instead focusing on a new thousand-bed hospital finished in 10 days flat. Needed for sure, but not enough to solve all the problems. For Canadians locked down in Hubei province, the area around Wuhan, the focus is on just getting out. Megan Millward, her husband and two children are from Montreal, waiting for a Canadian airlift promised in the coming days. We're all right. We're still not showing any symptoms, um, so that's great. We're just uh, tired and increasingly antsy and worried. Sasha, the government confirmed today that 325 Canadians have now asked to be part of that airlift out of Wuhan. What is in store for them? Well, there's a number of challenges. First of all, it's not clear that everybody who wants to go will fit onto the plane that uh, Canada has chartered. Also, there's negotiations that have to happen between different levels of government here, here in Beijing and also in Wuhan. And once all of that is done, um, once the agreements are in place, Canada has to act very, very quickly, which means that the plan is for the plane to be sitting nearby in the region, ready to fly in at a moment's notice. And of course, the Canadians here in China have been warned they also have to be ready at a moment's notice. Ian? Sasha Petrasik in Beijing. Thank you. So what's it like to be one of those 325 Canadians stuck in China, forced to wait for the government to bring them home? Wayne Tremblay is from Vancouver Island. He's been in Wuhan with his wife for the last 12 days, and he joins us now. I'm really curious, Wayne, about that, that waiting period. What has life been like for the last few days? 
uh, it's been pretty boring, uh, tedious. Um, it started out kind of fun and novel, and people were finding ways to fill in the time. Uh, but as time goes on, um, it becomes more stressful. Um, the days are very long, and there's there's just not a lot to do, and just time to to read bad news is really what's the last couple of days have been like. So we hear about a city that's been shut down. Have you been able to get outside at all? We've gone out three times to buy groceries just within our own complex, but we haven't been, like, you, you can't really leave beyond that. And when you go out even within the complex for groceries, is uh, are people wearing masks? Are you kind of worried about someone who you might hear coughing uh, near where you are? Everyone's wearing masks. You, you know, in our area, as far as we know, there haven't been any um, instances of, of, of the virus, uh, but everyone is taking precautions for sure. Your wife is a permanent resident of Canada, but she is a, a Chinese citizen, so under the Chinese rules, she's not allowed to leave now. So the both of you have decided that you will come back without her. Yeah, it was a very difficult decision to make. Um, we had been discussing it prior to it even being newsworthy or mentioned previously, um, because we know every time we come here, that's the rules that we have to follow. Um, but because the timelines are just unknown at this time, uh, it was more important for me to get back and be able to provide for our family um, because we don't know how long we would be stuck here otherwise. And as of right now, you have no idea when that plane's going to be ready to take you? No, we've been receiving some information from the consular officials, but given the timelines at this point, it's going to be at least three days, I would guess. All right, Wayne Trombley, thank you very much and good luck to both of you. Thank you. A lot of questions still for the people inside Wuhan and a lot of questions for people here in Canada as well. Many of you have been sending your questions about the coronavirus to us. In about 20 minutes, we'll have some answers. Well, they've begun to mop up in parts of southern BC, the region hammered by intense rain this weekend. It has led to flooding, mudslides, power outages and the disruption of phone and internet service. Tanya Fletcher starts us off. This weekend was one for the record books. A relentless storm has drenched BC's south coast, a region used to rain, but not like this. This is not the typical run-of-the-mill uh, autumn or winter storm uh, like we see several uh, every season. We're thinking it may be on the order of once every 5 to uh, 20 years. Vancouver Island caught the brunt of it, some areas recording a whopping 370 millimetres of rain in just over 24 hours. The intense system stretching south into Washington state, downpours drowning the Sumas border crossing, closing it altogether. It triggered states of emergencies in pockets of the Fraser Valley too, including the district of Kent where 32 homes had to be evacuated as the water kept rising. It was relentless, it just kept going and going. Our water infrastructure is damaged and uh, the road, it is also damaged um, quite severely. The flash floods have also caused mudslides, wiping out entire stretches of road, including the only access to Sasquatch Mountain Ski Hill, a few hours east of Vancouver, stranding some 400 people at the top. We have had uh, an update from the roads crews that it's kind of looking at about another three to four days um, before they can open up the road to at least single lane traffic. In the meantime, a helicopter has started shuttling people off the mountain for $150 each, a flight to nearby Chilliwack. The fact that we could have been trapped all week got us out on the helicopter, uh, but we're happy to be out. We had a great time. We had lots of food. The lodge was amazing. Uh, they took care of everyone on the mountain. The chopper is not only dropping people off, but also airlifting supplies back up to the resort. There is some good news on the horizon. A brief stretch of dry weather is in the forecast, and many are hoping it's enough time to recover from this last storm before the next system rolls in sometime midweek. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver. And the impact of the rain goes beyond washed out roads and flooded basements. It's also disrupted phone and internet service, including in our newsroom. Anita Bath has been looking at how wide this impact has been. Anita. It's really hard to say, Ian, and that's part of the frustration. It could be 5,000 people or 2 million. And what we do know is across BC, customers with Rogers, Telus, Bell, Fido, and all other carriers have been having problems since yesterday. 
Perhaps one of the biggest concerns, though, the RCMP and police non-emergency lines have been affected throughout. Many of them tweeting out that if you try to call them, you won't actually get through. The fire, the ambulance, the fire, or the, the police, nothing would connect properly. It kept on coming up with a, this no, number is no longer in service. Jeremy Tykrub was trying to call 911 about a house alarm going off, but he says the dispatchers themselves couldn't actually get in touch with police, fire or ambulance. This never should have happened. Our emergency services are there for a reason and the emergency numbers should never fail us. I, I've got three children of my own and I could just imagine one of them being hurt and me not being able to get help for one of my kids. It would be one of the worst feelings ever to be able to not get help for one of your kids. And Anita, what do we know about the cause of this outage? Well, Rogers Communications is blaming a landslide four and a half hours away from Vancouver by car. It happened just north of Boston Bar near the Fraser Canyon community of North Bend. That landslide damaged a fiber cable and that has apparently caused the widespread outage. But here's the thing, when a power outage happens, we know the cause. We know how many customers are out. We have an idea of when power will be restored. In this case, customers just aren't getting any answers. All right, Anita, thank you. For the U.S. president and all those wanting to win that job next, this is a big week. Tomorrow, the Iowa caucuses will be held, the first real test for Democratic candidates in the race for the White House. And then there's Donald Trump's impeachment trial, where closing arguments will begin. But as Paul Hunter tells us, Trump has his sights set on the long game. On the impeachment process against him, Donald Trump, this time in his pre-Super Bowl presidential interview, made his disdain clear. I use the word witch hunt. I use the word hoax. Uh, I see the hatred. I see the, the level. They don't care about fairness. They don't care about lying. You look at the lies. To recap. Democrats in the House of Representatives impeached Trump in December for trying to pressure Ukraine's president into digging up dirt on rival Joe Biden and then blocking the investigation into that. But in a vote set for this Wednesday in the U.S. Senate, controlled by Republicans, it's all but certain Trump will be allowed to stay in office. So he's now pivoting to the November election. Under President Trump, America is stronger. This campaign ad, airing in tonight's Super Bowl, focuses on the economy. In other words, forget about impeachment. The best is yet to come. I really believe this administration, me and this administration, we've done more than any administration in the history of our country. But also airing in tonight's game. I know Mike is not afraid of the gun lobby. An ad from presidential hopeful Mike Bloomberg, who's become a target for Trump, today mocking Bloomberg's physical stature. I just think of little. You know, now he wants a box for the debates to stand on. Okay, it's okay. There's nothing wrong. You could be short. Why should he get a box to stand on, okay? On that, the Bloomberg campaign called Trump a pathological liar. Trump also today repeated disparaging nicknames for Biden and other Democratic candidates, including Elizabeth Warren and self-described Democratic Socialist Bernie Sanders. I think he's a communist. I mean, you know, look, I think of communism when I think of Bernie. The kickoff, in a sense, to Trump's 2020 campaign. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. The Democratic candidates crisscrossed Iowa today ahead of tomorrow's caucuses, trying to convince voters that they are the candidate to take on Donald Trump in November and win. And as Susan Ormiston explains, the race is tight. Back to Iowa after the impeachment trial and Senator Warren is stomping hard because anything can happen in the Iowa caucus. Will you be my candidate for president? Oh. Oh. Will yes. you marry me? I will be Elizabeth candidate. Warren and Pete Buttigieg trail Bernie Sanders enjoying a late stage burn knocking back uh, Joe Biden. All four at the top grasping for the critical momentum that comes out of a win in Iowa. Mayor John Lindell is a Biden guy. The stakes are incredibly high, and I think the Democrats are very anxious that the right person gets picked that can defeat the President Trump uh, in the fall. They don't want me to be the nominee because, you know, I'll beat him like a drum. 
the former vice president's being challenged, and not just by Democrats. We all settle for Biden. I think you could be the Hillary of uh, His protesters saying, oh, let's all settle with Biden, the Clinton of 2020. Biden suspects a plant. I thought they were exaggerating when they said that the Republicans said they were sending out 80 people to uh, participate in the Democratic caucus here. Here at Iowa University, students conducted a mock caucus on the weekend. Hey, team Biden, go over by Joe there. Practicing the art of persuasion, convincing a Democrat from one team to walk over and join another candidate's corner. Welcome boosting their vote, exactly what will play out in 1,600 precincts tomorrow. Instead of basically two candidates, we've got six or seven candidates that are live rounds in Iowa, and so it's more complicated and the decisions are more complicated for voters. Mm -hmm. Crazy a little bit, it's intense. Iowa has never seen this tight a race with this number of candidates at this stage. Democrats, though, have a long way to go to coalesce around one nominee. And meanwhile, Donald Trump is campaigning aggressively every week. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Des Moines, Iowa. So it is the eve of a very big day in the story of the 2020 presidential election. Yeah, you got it, Ian, which is why the National has come to Iowa. This building is calm right now. Enjoy the peace. But tomorrow, thousands of members of the media from around the world will be packed in here. When all the drama plays out and the results come in, it will be exceptionally loud. This is, of course, Des Moines, the capital of this small but crucially important state when it comes to picking a presidential nominee. This is where the crowd of Democratic candidates should start to shrink. So a strong showing here is a major boost to any candidate's campaign. A weak one could mean trouble. And don't think of this as a typical voting experience. What will happen tomorrow is lively. It is loud. It is so complex. It's best explained with props. So the Iowa caucuses are not chess, but they are a bit complicated and they are about choosing a champion. So think of four contenders in their corners and all the pawns in the center as the registered Democratic voters. So the voting is all out in the open. There are no secrets here. And picking your candidate means physically moving to your candidate. In round one of voting, let's say two of the contenders get a pretty healthy proportion of the votes. The other two don't seem to get enough. What's enough? In Iowa, candidates need 15% of the vote to be considered viable. And what if they don't get it? That's why there's a round two. So the two main candidates are sitting pretty. Their voters are locked in. They cannot change their minds. But all the others now have to choose. So they could pick no one and just go home. They could join up and make one of their own candidates viable. Or they could just go to one of the big two. Hey, Hillary! This is where Iowa gets beautifully messy. If you look at the pictures of caucuses past, you'll see that across 1,600 precincts in the state and churches and schools and gyms. Richard, look at this room! They should get behind him too. People are shouting and wooing and cajoling each other to come over to their candidate's side. A new twist this year, there are only two rounds of voting, that's it. And what votes the candidates get here will translate into votes they get at the big national convention this summer. The fact is, though, Iowa does not choose the ultimate Democratic nominee. But it's where the momentum begins, and sometimes there is a very big surprise. So this being the first test for candidates, every element will be studied for what it could mean nationally. Iowa is 85% white, but its Latino population is growing, like in the United States as a whole. So it's a bit interesting to see how campaigns are going after those voters. So we went to a phone and text bank that was organized by a group called LULAC. That's an alliance of Latino voters. There was a small but pretty enthusiastic group reaching out here in Iowa, aiming to get strong representation in the caucuses. And what we heard from them is that they really feel largely abandoned by the Democratic candidates, with the exception of the Bernie Sanders campaign. Joe Henry, who is with LULAC, says the Sanders team has been in constant contact and is investing heavily in bilingual outreaches. Who did you expect to hear from who you haven't heard from? Well, we were expecting to hear from the Biden campaign and definitely the Elizabeth Warren campaign. We have kind of got a hands-off approach from them. Uh, the Biden campaign uh, sent uh, Latina surrogate here uh, months ago. 
We sat down with her to talk about our community, but we never got a response back. So he wonders if these campaigns are calculating that they have to put their efforts elsewhere, and if so, he thinks they might just pay for that nationally as the American electorate is getting more diverse. So that's one reason the numbers will be scrutinized tomorrow, Ian. Uh, another one is that, that really there'll be a lot more of them. For the first time, the results of the popular vote will also be released. Love the chess set, by the way, and we'll wait to see how the candidates <laughs> spin those uh, early results. In about half an hour, we'll take a closer look at the Democratic frontrunners. Then our special coverage of the Iowa caucuses continues tomorrow. We'll also be watching as closing arguments begin in Donald Trump's impeachment trial and on Tuesday as Trump delivers the annual State of the Union. Now, some stories we're watching tonight include that double stabbing in London, which police are calling a terror incident. You see this happening and you own those steps. It's just bloody stupid. Police shot and killed the suspect. They found him wearing what looked like a bomb. It was fake, though. Police were watching him after his release from prison on a terror conviction. One of the two stabbing victims is in life-threatening condition. A third person was hurt by flying glass from the shooting. And it was a frigid night for six snowmobilers in Quebec's eastern townships. They sank after their machines crossed a stretch of Lake Magog. Four got out themselves with the first responders pulling out the other two. One who'd been in the water nearly half an hour is recovering from severe hypothermia. A memorial north of Toronto today for two of the victims of the Iran air disaster. Dr. Parisa Agbalian and her daughter Rira Esmalian were among the 57 Canadians killed. I know she loves her job, but more importantly, she, she loved her, her daughter and her husband so much. Husband and father Hamed Esmalian said darkness has embraced him, but he thanks Canadian officials for their help in bringing his loved ones home. Now to another air tragedy. Boeing 737 MAX 8 jets have been grounded for almost a year following two crashes that killed 346 people. But you might be surprised to hear that some MAX 8s are still allowed to fly. Ashley Burke looked into why. Canada is allowing the 737 MAXs to regularly crisscross North America under special circumstances with no passengers on board. It feels like a slap in the face. It comes as a shock to those who lost loved ones in a 737 MAX. Chris Moore's 24-year-old daughter died almost a year ago in the Ethiopian Airlines tragedy. Paul Giroge also lost his wife, three children and mother-in-law. The meaning of grounding is remain on the ground. The fact that they are still flying, it just tells you that these people will never stop uh, playing or juggling with human life. CBC News analyzed flight data. It shows Air Canada, WestJet and Sunwing flew at least 160 flights since officials placed restrictions on the fleet in March, including from Montreal to Arizona, Toronto to Kelowna and Halifax to Windsor. Airplanes are like cars. You can't leave them sitting around with those things starting to happen. Maintenance is one reason Transport Canada is allowing what it calls ferry flights. The other is to move jets for storage, sometimes in warmer climates, or to keep pilots certified. These are not flying bombs about to explode. They're not going to start dropping out of the sky on people. These are very safe airplanes flown under those conditions. Those conditions. Only advanced pilots can fly with specialized briefings and simulator training. A mandatory third pilot and extra crew must be on board, and they can only fly in certain weather conditions. That tells you a lot about the uh, uh, regulatory authorities, uh, the, you know, promoting the industry instead of promoting safety, instead of safeguarding the lives of human beings. Transport Canada says it won't allow passengers back on the 737 MAXs until it's satisfied with changes being made. But families who lost loved ones want the planes to stay on the ground. No exceptions. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. A BC couple is going public after thousands of dollars were stolen and their bank blamed them. My heart is coming through my chest and I said, well, these are not our charges, these are fraud. Next on The National, the not-so-secure tech that most banks rely on. Plus, you asked, we answer. Our inbox has been flooded with questions about the coronavirus. We put them to the experts ahead. And cheering for Team Canada in the Super Bowl.
the amount of dedication and work it takes to be a professional athlete and a doctor. I don't know how that guy sleeps. McGill students celebrate one of their own in the big game. We're back in two. Surveillance photos showed someone else withdrawing thousands from a bank customer's account, but the bank still said the customer was to blame. And this case has advocates sounding the alarm about bank investigations that they say are stacked against the customer. Now our Go Public team is taking a closer look. Here's Rosa Marcatelli. Carol and Bill Pitts discovered their CIBC visa was stolen while vacationing in Mexico. They called the bank to report the theft. He proceeded to say there was um, uh, the tune of $4,000 on my card. And this is now my heart is coming through my chest. And I said, well, these are not our charges. These are fraud. That was the beginning of a battle with their bank to try and get their money back. CIBC decided the couple was liable, saying their chip and pin were used, accusing them of writing it down or giving it out. Then I started getting angry because um, to be accused of lying or uh, being a fool, uh, we're neither. They say they asked the bank for proof the pin was used, but were denied. In a similar case, Cleopatra Evelyn Clark also asked her bank for proof and was denied, she says, when someone walked into a Montreal RBC branch and walked out with more than $6,600 of her money. The thief's image was caught on the bank's surveillance cameras, but the bank blamed the customer, saying her debit card and pin were used. At no time did I give anyone my card or my pin. Actually, I was in possession of my card. I know exactly where I was during the time of both transactions. RBC says it's never seen a case where a chip and pin card has been successfully counterfeited. But a tech expert says it is possible. People who adequately protect their pins are still at risk of having their transactions compromised. There's no way to know exactly what happened in either the Pitts or Evelyn Clark's case. That's because banks hold all the cards when it comes to fraud investigations, says this consumer protection advocate. He says there is a voluntary rule banks have agreed to follow that puts the onus on them to prove a customer's to blame. The rules say if the customer disputes the charge, um, it's up to the bank to show that the pin was compromised or that the customer was negligent. RBC says it did follow that rule with Evelyn Clark. Both banks say they investigated thoroughly before coming to a decision. Go Public asked about the security of the chip and pin system, and CIBC didn't answer the question. RBC insists it is secure. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. Hey, remember, our Go Public stories come from you, so if you have a tip for Rosa and the team to investigate, send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. Next, on The National. Your questions, expert answers. What does an international public health emergency really mean for you? Our experts are here with the answers, plus. Somewhat, hopefully, optimistic-ish, I would Not say. very convincing. Ah, uh, well, I know, it's tough. We're worried. For the first time, voters get a chance to weigh in on the race to be the Democratic nominee. We're on the front lines of the campaigns for the four frontrunners. Back right after this. It's so new and everyone's freaking out about it. We don't know how to stay safe besides putting hand sanitizer and washing our hands and stuff like that. We don't know other precautions to take. As the coronavirus spreads well beyond China, people are hungry for hard facts on the best way to protect themselves. And as we've seen, bogus information can be dangerous. It can raise needless fears or give people a false sense of security. So once again, we've gathered some of your questions to put to the health experts to try to bring you real answers that you can use. Dr. Colin Lee is a specialist in preventive medicine and infectious diseases. He's in Toronto this evening. And Dr. Kathleen Ross is president of Doctors of BC, and she's here with me in Vancouver. Dr. Ross, let me start with you and a question we're getting from a lot of people. Uh, Lucia asked this particular one, mask versus no mask. What do you suggest? Uh, it depends on the situation. So masks can contain large respiratory droplets that may have infectious material when you place that mask on someone who is ill. They do very little to protect those in the public walking around unless they're in close contact with an infected person. And what about eye protection? Certainly it is best if you're in co close contact with a patient suspected of carrying a virus. Wearing eye protection in addition to a mask helps to protect those of us that are in close contact and that applies to family members but also frontline uh, 
primary care providers that are taking swabs of nose or throat. Dr. Lee, let me put uh, this next question to you. It's from a viewer named Doug. Uh, he asks, do the airlines have a decontamination protocol for soft surfaces like seats and carpets and blankets on planes? As far as I understand it, uh, you know, when a plane deplanes, uh, they certainly clean uh, the, uh, the plane with some vacuuming, but certainly I wouldn't say it's a decontamination. Um, I, I think your, uh, your audience is wondering, you know, is it, uh, can you get uh, the coronavirus from sitting in a seat and, and getting the virus particles? You know, I, I would say that, you know, you should be taking uh, precautions by uh, making sure that uh, you uh, wash your hands even more frequently because you'll be touching surfaces that other people would have touched. You can also bring some antiseptic wipes and wipe the hard surfaces like the table. But certainly the seats and the fabric, there's not much you can do about that. Um, the virus does survive a number of hours, maybe a day, maybe two days on, on those seats. And Dr. Lee, this is a different version of that implicit question about how long the virus can survive on surfaces. Francine asks whether she should be concerned about receiving a package in the mail from Wuhan, China. There's no concern about that. Um, the, 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 the virus likely lasts um, a day, maybe two days on the surface. So the chances of picking something up on a package that you receive from Wuhan, there's a bigger chance that you're going to get virus particles from your friendly uh, uh, mail delivery person. Um, and just like anything else, after you open your package, make sure you wash your hands and before you touch your nose and face and, and you'll be good. And I guess to clarify, the, the potential virus transmission from the person delivering the mail, you're not referring to, to the new coronavirus, but no. basically any of those many viruses that are floating around in, in, right. in society at any time. Uh, Dr. Ross, let me put this question to you from Sandy. Uh, she says, apparently passengers arriving from China are only being asked if they visited Wuhan in the last 14 days and if they had a fever. Is that effective screening? I think for the moment that's reasonable. I'd like to reiterate that the risk to Canadians is low and we had some experience uh, with advanced screening during the SARS epidemic that uh, resulted in a very expensive process for, for uh, border guards and did not identify any additional cases. And Dr. Lee, here's a question from April. How many people who have died from the coronavirus were otherwise healthy people? How much do we know about that? I don't, th I don't think we know the exact numbers, but, but we do know that the majority of people who have unfortunately succumbed to the illness have had um, some medical conditions as well as our older uh, adults. Um, unfortunately, uh, that kind of information that we're seeking is not readily available, um, but I think that the coronavirus likely behaves like any other uh, uh, virus in, in that it tends to affect the elderly and, and uh, persons with uh, more medical conditions. And it's notable, I talked about this on The National on Friday, but it bears uh, repeating, four confirmed cases in Canada, none of the four in hospital at this point, and, and the youngest in her 20s uh, had what were described as relatively mild uh, symptoms. This next question is from Kevin. I'm going to put it to both of you, but maybe start with Dr. Ross. Uh, advice on how to lessen the probability that I or my family would become infected. I would give patients the same advice as I would to all patients during the cold and flu season. Make sure that you wash your hands well with soap and water for at least 20 seconds before you touch your mouth or your nose. Wash your hands before you prepare or eat food. Uh, ensure that you cough into your elbow and try to avoid uh, close contact with those who are ill. I don't think I have too much to add to that. I think it's the same way that uh, we would approach not getting a cold or the flu. And I think for those few uh, Canadians that are arriving back from the areas of concern, I think the most important thing is if you do develop a cough, a fever, or become short of breath, don't rush to the clinic, don't rush to go see someone. Give a call to public health, give a call to telehealth, give a call to your healthcare provider, tell them about the issue, and listen to the, their advice on what to do next. Dr. Lee, I guess a general question from me. I see on the one hand, you know, headlines like global health emergency, uh, epidemic, you know, these, these dire concerns that people have, uh, the number of people who have died in China. And so there is a real sense of anxiety among a lot of people that I'm talking to here in Canada. What would you say to people who are anxious about the risk they feel they have from this virus? I mean, this is a new disease. It is affecting a lot of people. Thankfully for Canadians at this time, 
it is affecting largely uh, people in China. We have a real possibility right now to contain the virus. We've only had four cases. We've had no community transmission. And this is our job. The job we're doing right now is to contain the virus here. If it does get here, it has. We've been able to contain it. We haven't seen it transmitted to another person who hasn't traveled. And this is the goal right now. The next couple of weeks will be telling. And Dr. Ross, in your practice, you're seeing people and also in your position, uh, not just patients, but physicians as well, you're saying to me that are very anxious about what's happening here. What do you say to them? I think that we have to have good public health and hygiene practices, both personally and professionally. We are very grateful, those of us standing on the front line, for the continuous updates from our medical health officers and the CDC. And we hugely appreciate the 24-7 advice that's available to us when we, when we speak to ill patients or when we see them. The other point that I have been emphasizing to my patients is to ensure that your vaccines are up to date. If you had your flu vaccine this year, if you're eligible, have you had your pneumonia vaccine? Are your children's vaccines primary series up to date? This also counts as prevention. All right, Dr. Ross, Dr. Lee, thank you very much for coming in and, and sharing your expertise with us. Thank you. Thank you. So, of course, those are just some of your questions. As this story develops in the coming days and months, we'll keep trying to answer them. So. Keep sending us questions, thoughts, issues, complaints by email. Uh, just send it to the national at cbc.ca. Next on the campaign trail, before the next vote, we'll hear from the candidates Bernie, Biden, Warren, Buttigieg. Susan Ormason finds out what it takes to be a front runner. Democracy starts here in Iowa every four years. It is the beginning of the end for Donald Trump. This is the eve of a big day in U.S. politics. Tomorrow are the Iowa caucuses, the first real test for a crowd of Democratic presidential hopefuls ahead of the November election. Come out a winner and they pick up momentum. Don't and they risk losing it all. And the race is tight. Four candidates bunched together at the top, others who could still surge. Susan Ormiston takes us into the last-minute push for votes. And now, here's your host, John Lovett. Podcast superhero John Lovett, live in Iowa City just before Democrats make their choice. I hope you people know what you're doing. The Love It or Leave It show offering up some badly needed laughs. <laughs> and Bernie and Biden are trading frontrunner status in every major poll this past week. They are neck and neck, which is a little gross because both of their necks are pretty loose at this point. <laughs> Jokes aside, Democrats are anxious, torn over the right choice to take on Donald Trump. Honestly, it's terrifying. Um, I'm terrified. I hope that everyone that um, is sitting at home right now not following it will wake up and follow it and realize what's going on and um, kind of not just be complacent. Now, how do you feel about the election this year? Uh, somewhat hopefully optimistic-ish. Not would say. very convincing. Uh, well, I know, it's tough. We're worried. I was the first test for a presidential run and Bernie Sanders is surging. But there's a tight cluster of candidates jostling him at the top. Sanders has built a formidable ground team since he ran in 2016, and this is one last rallying cry to get out supporters on Monday. First up on the agenda is to defeat the most dangerous president in the modern history of this country. In Iowa City, his campaign office nestles next to the Salvation Army, fitting for the socialist senator with promises to overhaul social programs. This is the final weekend. And Jay McClure from Washington State and Justin Goldberg from Chicago are heading out for last day canvassing in Jay's Bernie van. How's your button supply, by the way? My button supply is low. You're the button guy. I've got yeah. hundreds of stickers. My buttons are low. When they finally express that commitment to caucus, that's when I pull out the button and ask them to wear this to caucus so that we can find them easily. They got A, B, C. Loyalty means nothing if you can't get Iowans out to caucus on Monday. You mind if I greet them, Jay? 
No, you go for it. Bernie right. volunteers have knocked on a half a million doors in January. Here's one more. Hi. Hi there. How are you this morning? Oh, Bernie guys. That's right. If you have any friends or family who are on the fence or they don't think they can participate, bring them along yeah. and make sure to get them signed up. Uh, if they don't want to be a Democrat on Tuesday, they don't have to be a Democrat on Tuesday, just on Monday night. Iowa is all about momentum. All right, we found a burner. And Bernie's bold ideas are shaking things up. Education for all, internet for all, Green New Deal, trying to address problems today, finally. Joe Biden's got the most to lose here in Iowa, long seen as the front runner. He's facing headwinds. His campaign dubbed, you know Joe, is peddling experience, a safe, comforting choice for Democrats craving stability in chaotic times. When John Lundell became mayor of so Coralville, like kind of Iowa, Joe here. Biden yeah. called him to so congratulate. Next, my, uh, he got a visit to the White House. We spent um, 45 minutes uh, chatting with the vice president about everything from sports to politics. So it was, it was a wonderful opportunity, and that began my friendship with Joe Biden. And what was your takeaway from Joe Biden then? Uh, he was just such a sincere, gentle man, he, just like you and I. Um, I he didn't have any uh, hidden agendas or anything. And I think that uh, Biden, because he is more traditionalist, has the, the skills and opportunity to maybe uh, heal the country a little faster. There is a sense that some people are, are now worried that Bernie Sanders might win. Mm -hmm. Do you get that sense? Um, yeah, yes, I, I think and there is why? a concern. Well, I go back to electability, and, and I don't think this country is ready for a socialist, and it really worries me that you're, you're giving um, President Trump a heads up by, by going with a candidate such as Bernie. I'm supporting Senator Elizabeth Warren, and I'm hoping you'll do the same. Elizabeth Warren's team has been working Iowa for 10 months. Or do you know who you're going to support? Or? Uh, yeah. You are super great. She surged last fall and slipped from the top, but arguably has one of the most organized campaigns nationally. The woman with a plan for everything, her slogan, has a path to win, maybe not in Iowa, but in later states, says organizer Rod Sullivan. I honestly believe that Warren is kind of the consensus choice among the four or five people that are polling the best. And uh, when you start to think about uh, who people would settle for, uh, if you will. Uh, you know, Biden people are not gonna go with Bernie and Bernie people are not gonna go with Biden. Um, I think Warren is very much a consensus candidate and I think she has a chance to uh, end up on top. Back at the live show, Pete is pulling support. That's Pete Buttigieg, the other candidate at the top. Mary Rarick came from Oregon to canvas for him. I'm organizing for the state of Oregon, but Oregon doesn't even matter if we, we don't do well here, right? Please welcome Michael Moore. Michael Moore, the filmmaker, showing up, and he's a Bernie guy, but he's got a stern reminder for this crowd. Fight it out now for a nominee, but remember, the long game. We're all gonna go in there in November, not just ourselves, not with our little gloomy faces, oh, my candidate didn't win. <laughs> we're all gonna go in there, and we're gonna fucking take that thing and mark it for the D. Mark it for the D. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Iowa City, Iowa. Next, finding inspiration in the Super Bowl. It's a real uh, point of pride for all of us. He's a McGill grad, a doctor, and now he's playing in the big game. What that means for current McGill students in our moment. On this Super Bowl Sunday, the doctor was in Quebec's Laurent Duvernay-Tardif of the Kansas City Chiefs became the first doctor to play in the big game. He earned his medical degree from McGill, and today students there were talking about his accomplishments with a little bit of pride and a tiny bit of envy. And that is our moment. Having McGill alum playing such a high level not only is great for McGill, but also really puts what he's done so far in his career and his life on show to the whole entire world. It's Really nice to see a really high level athlete at that level be so invested in his education as well as being uh, super, a superstar in sports. He's pretty incredible. Um, 
the amount of dedication and work it takes to be a professional athlete and a doctor in his case is, is quite remarkable. And um, I don't know how that guy sleeps. The joke I always make is like, come on, like he's, he can have everything and he, he really does. He's a, he's a doctor, he's a phenomenal athlete, obviously. Um, it's the guy's unbelievable. Are you going to be watching the game? 100%. Of course, come on. My question is that. Don't have a score, but I'm going Chiefs for sure. Unfortunately not. I got I have two midterms this week, so I got to study for those. I'll, I'll try to watch highlights and maybe the second half. I got to get home and study now. So. I think I speak on behalf of a lot of university students and former university students when I say I apologize for ever, ever, ever claiming that my workload in school was too great. What a fantastic story is. That is the National for 0202 2020. Good night.